Hello, this is Professor Matt Catrullis at Rio Hondo College. Uh, here we're going to be taking a look at uh, experiment 15 for Chemistry 110 with the subject being alcohols and phenols. So as in the previous lab, we're going to be zeroing in on particular functional groups, as mentioned a moment ago, alcohols and phenols. Structurally, these types of compounds all contain a hydroxyl group. That is the OH group, and that will be bonded to a carbon atom. The first thing I want us to really focus on when we look at alcohols is what we call the substitution pattern of the alcohols, whether they're primary, secondary, or tertiary. Let me skip down here. And we can see, for example, on the left, we have an example of what is called a primary alcohol. It is primary because the carbon, which is bonded to the hydroxyl group, is itself only bonded to one other carbon. And so that's what makes a primary alcohol, this carbon being bonded to one carbon. On the other hand, this is a secondary alcohol because this carbon here, the one uh, bearing the hydroxyl group, is bonded to two carbons. And a tertiary alcohol is one where the carbon is bonded to three other carbon atoms. In fact, in this experiment, we will see these actual compounds in use. This compound is ethanol. This compound is called isopropyl alcohol. And this compound here, t-butyl alcohol, is also known as 2-methyl-2-propanol. And the reason we really want to focus on this is because these sometimes give different types of reactions. And so if we were given a mystery alcohol to identify, which we're not actually going to do in this experiment, uh, we could look at the results of these chemical tests and say, well, this looks like a primary alcohol or this looks like a tertiary alcohol. The other important group of compound here is going to be the phenols. Uh, phenols are aromatic compounds that contain that hydroxyl group. Uh, and we're only going to look at the actual compound phenol, so it's not going to have any other groups on it, no methyls or amines or any other types of functional groups. Alcohols are generally neutral when we look at their acidity. They tend to have pHs close to about 6 or 7. Phenols, on the other hand, are substantially more acidic. They are weak acids, and recall what that means is that if it's a weak acid, it partly dissociates into ions in solution. What that means, if we look at the structure here of phenol, is that this hydrogen will partially dissociate as H plus ions, making the solution a little bit more acidic. Not a lot, but noticeably more acidic than just ordinary primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohols. Now, there is a temptation to call phenols tertiary alcohols, because, or even secondary. Some people would say secondary because this carbon is bonded to two other carbons. Some people might say, well, it's more like a tertiary alcohol because this carbon um, doesn't have any hydrogens on it. Uh, which is characteristic of tertiary alcohols, but we really shouldn't use that classification at all for phenols. So don't think of phenols as being primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohols. We are now going to look at some virtual molecular models for part A. Here is the model for ethanol. Notice the red sphere stands for oxygen. The white spheres, again, stand for hydrogens, and the grayer spheres stand for carbon atoms. Here we see the model for 2-propanol, also called isobutyl alcohol. This is the model for 2-methyl-2-propanol, also sometimes known as 
T-butyl alcohol. And this is a model for phenol. Notice that those uh, dashed lines are supposed to represent the circle for an aromatic ring, or that could be considered a alternating pattern of double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond around the ring. Notice the flat aromatic ring of phenol. We now move on to part B, where we'll look at some of the properties of alcohols and phenols. And the most important uh, fact to realize about these types of compounds is that they are able to engage in hydrogen bonding, which you'll recall is the strongest of the intermolecular forces that we learned. The other intermolecular forces are dipole-dipole forces and London dispersion forces. Uh, it would definitely be to your advantage to, rem uh, to review hydrogen bonding in chapter 4, but I'm going to give a very brief overview right here. Let's take a look at these two molecules here. They are both ethanol molecules. We know that these lines, straight lines, stand for regular covalent bonds. Those are the interatomic forces, the bonding forces that hold the molecules together. However, these two molecules are going to be attracted to each other quite strongly by what we call a hydrogen bond, which is represented by this dashed line right here. So a hydrogen bond is a strong intermolecular force which occurs between hydrogens, which are bonded to F, O, or N atoms, in other words, the three most electronegative atoms, and some other F, O, or N atom because it is going to have a partial negative charge on it. So this hydrogen here is very much a partially positive hydrogen because its electrons are being pulled away by this oxygen. So it's going to be attracted to some other negatively partial charged atom like oxygen. If we consider what will happen with ethanol in water, we see that because water is also able to engage in hydrogen bonding, we would expect for these two to uh, be mixable with each other. In other words, that ethanol would dissolve in water. So we need quite a bit of energy to separate alcohol molecules because of the hydrogen bonding which occurs between them. And so we find that alcohols tend to be rather high boiling compounds and have rather high melting points if we were to compare them to molecules with similar molecular weights, say alkanes or ethers or some other functional group. We generally find that small alcohols, those with fewer than five carbons, are soluble in water, although the more carbon atoms we add, the less soluble they tend to be in water. So methanol, ethanol, extremely soluble. On the other hand, once we exceed uh, five carbons, what we find is their solubility starts to become more like alkanes. So let's think back to the important phrase about solubility, like dissolves like. We know that polar solvents like to dissolve polar solutes and nonpolar solvents with nonpolar solutes. Once we start adding beyond five carbons with all their hydrogens, uh, the molecule starts to look more like a hydrocarbon than it does an alcohol. And so therefore hydrocarbons tend to be very nonpolar. And so once we get to a point, a tipping point, so to speak, beyond five or six carbons, they have more nonpolar characteristics than they do polar and are less likely to dissolve in water. Now phenol has six carbons, so we might initially expect it to be insoluble in water based on what I just talked about. But that aromatic ring positioned next to the lone pairs of oxygen makes the molecule somewhat more polar. And it's not something we're going to go into 
uh, with a lot of detail right here. You just have to take my word for this. But uh, And in fact, we will see it. But phenol should be soluble in water. The other issue we're going to look at in Part B is the relative acidity of alcohols. So you will see pictures of samples of several alcohols tested with pH paper. And what you're going to want to do here when you see those pictures is compare the color of the wet portion of the picture to the reference sheet, which lists pH going from 0 to 14. What pH values do we expect to see? Now remember, we said that alcohols are generally quite neutral. So neutral would be a pH of 7. So I would expect alcohols to show a pH in the range of about 6 or 7, typically, very, very close to that. Now phenols, on the other hand, remember we said are weakly acidic. So it is likely that their pHs will be a little bit lower. Then I'm going to evaluate the solubility of each of these alcohols or phenol by taking 10 drops of them and adding it to about 2 milliliters of water. If they are soluble, then we do not expect a layer to form between the liquids. The, la the liquids will completely mix. On the other hand, if the alcohol is insoluble, you will see a separation. Uh, it will be marked as like a clear curved line within the liquid. For the rest of the experiment, it will indicate a section for you to provide information about an unknown. Uh, there is no unknown being tested in this experiment, so you can feel free to cross out any section which is marked unknown or leave it blank. So here we look at the alcohols being tested on pH paper. So you're looking at the top of the paper and comparing it to the chart on the left. This is ethanol. And this is 2-propanol. These might look a little dark owing to a lack of light. Two methyl 2-propanol. Looking again at the wetter part. Cyclohexanol. Phenol. And now all of the alcohols next to one another. And you'll notice one of those is definitely a little bit darker or redder than the others. Now we look at the solubility tests for those alcohols. So the first three alcohols there, ethanol, 2-propanol, 2-methyl-2-propanol. They look totally clear. I don't really see any layer. And for one of these, you should definitely notice something different. And it shouldn't be too surprising considering the number of carbons that that alcohol has.